right, so my name is Emma. Um, I am a fourth year medical student, um, just now applying to, to residency. Um, and really um, what we're gonna do today um, is a little bit different if, if you've been with us for our last few sessions. Um, this time, what we're gonna do is really emphasize, um, you know, a few different cases. So it's gonna be a, a few kind of quick fire cases. We're gonna do four of them today um, because I, I thought I would be doing you a disservice if, you know, we went over one infectious disease case. Um, because as you may know at this point, there are so many different, um, you know, bacteria, fungi, um, parasites, lots of things to talk about in infectious disease. So we're going to do four today. Um, as kind of a disclaimer, this doesn't cover all of infectious disease by any means. You know, all of our sessions don't cover all of what the topic entails. Um, but we are going to cover, um, you know, what I would consider quite a bit for, you know, an hour, uh, an hour's time. Okay, so um, this is a little bit of infectious disease, a little bit of a internal medicine, but um, let's get started here. Um, so uh, as always, um, please uh, view our, um, you know, our YouTube page. All of our videos are posted there after if you can't make it live, um, though we certainly want to encourage you to, to make it live to be um, more interactive with us. I think that certainly enhances your, your learning. Okay, so go to our YouTube page, um, please uh, subscribe. Um, you can always comment on any question, on any uh, videos, if you have any questions or anything like that, we try to keep up with that and, and monitor that. Um, if you guys have any questions for the recorded sessions. Okay, um, so um, we are, um, you know, talking a little bit of, of, bi of microbiology today. I found this, um, I found this, uh, little joke here, this meme, and I, I like literally laughed out loud. I was like, I have to put it in because it's like, it's so dumb, but it's really funny. Um, so let me start the pre-poll here. Um, so as always, um, please give me a little bit of a, an indication um, about what you know about infectious disease. All right, so it looks like most of you guys are in there. Um, let me share the results here for you. So we're kind of all over the place. So this this topic, it appears as though you guys, um, you know, know a little bit more about, which um, is excellent. So I, I, you know, anticipate that you guys will, you know, certainly um, interact and, and answer questions and stuff too. So um, we're gonna have lots of going on here, um, lots of different topics. So we'll, we'll try to cover them as um, you know as thoroughly as we can. But let's see if we can't shift some of you guys into the next uh, the next category here. Okay. All right. Let's keep it going here. All right, so I do have a little bit of a, a couple updates for you, but you know, as always, what we're going to do on um, this case outline um, or the session outline is a little bit different. Um, really, what we're going to do is we're going to cover like four cases. So it's going to be, you know, uh, the, the case, um, a little bit of the uh, physical exam, and then we're going to talk about the pathology right afterwards. And I found that that, um, you know, if you guys agree with that too, you can put it into the chat. Um, that helps you guys win the pathology or the lesson or the anatomy or whatever is kind of intertwined with what we're talking about as a, at the time, so that we can, you know, kind of reinforce the things that you're seeing within the case. Um, so that's what I tried to do here um, with these four cases. Um, as always, your guys' role, please participate, um, ask lots of questions, um, and fill out that SOAP note so you can get credit afterwards. Um, and, and once you submit that, the quizzes in the SOAP note um, will be due the, the Tuesday, um, the next Tuesday at midnight, um, so that you guys um, are really forced to think critically and, and, um, and, and get, uh, you know, credit for this or for your your um, participation here at these sessions um you know also we're, we're trying to enhance kind of your your active learning as well so um we don't want to keep them open for for too long and and not give you the that opportunity to to really think critically close to the actual event 
Um, could we pick one of the four cases for the soap? Yeah, good question. That's a great question um, that I um, had not considered before, but absolutely. Um, I, I think that you can pick one of four, um, whatever, you know, you see fit if you want to do the first one and then just, you know, kick back for the rest. Um, absolutely. You can absolutely do that. Um, you know, pick, pick whichever one most interests you as well. Um, you can do that as well. So good question, Bridget. Alrighty. All right, so here's that soap note form. Pick one of the four cases um, and, and just plug it in here. And when we're kind of talking here about subjective, what we're talking about is the things that the patient tells us, like the, um, the history and the ROS. Um, I think we, last time we did more than one. Oh yeah, perfect, Stephanie. Uh, that's great. Um, I, I don't know if anyone else has done more than one case. I thought I was being innovative, but if other people have done this, then great. I hope that it's, uh, I hope that it's helpful for you guys. Um, for uh, objective, um, you know, plug in those vital signs in the physical exam. Um, and those are the things that we find really. Um, I thought you were the one that did more than one case. Maybe it was, I don't know. I, I, I can't keep up with, with what I do and, and don't do these days. <laughs> I don't even know what I, I had for lunch today. So it, it's all a mess. Um, and then the A um, is for assessment and then the P is for plan. So um, that's really what you're gonna plug in here. Some of the information that I divulged to you might be a little bit, um, a little bit more concise, which is totally okay. Um, you know, if you want to go into more depth and, and, you know, fill out more information that would fit this case, absolutely do that. If I don't divulge a lot of, of the assessment and plan here, you can add more things. You know, nobody is going back and, and really checking in terms of, oh, you know, you shouldn't have put this in your soap note. Um, you know, you can certainly um, create this soap note to really practice your ability to document um, and, uh, you know, prepare yourself for your future medical education. Okay. All right. So I have a little bit of an introduction here. Um, and, and what we're going to do um, mainly uh, is, is kind of introduce um, this idea of microbiology. Um, has anyone out there so far taken any microbiology? Oh, great. So Matthew can teach this and I will sit back and I'll drink, I'll drink my um, pumpkin coffee that I got today because today is the first day of fall or so they say. It's still hot here, um, but um, lots of people have. So all of you guys can, um, all of you guys can teach this lesson. So maybe that's why you guys all um, elected that you know some stuff, which is great. So what we're going to talk about here is kind of this classification of bacteria. Yes, when we talk about um, when we talk about microbiology, there's lots of things we can consider. We can consider virology, obviously the study of viruses. We can talk about bacteria. We can talk about parasites. There, it, it kind of is, is an all-encompassing umbrella term, if you will. So when we talk about this, we often kind of bring it back to the cell envelope. And if you look at this, um, and if you look at this cartoon up here, what we see is this difference in, um, you know, the, the, back, the bacterial cell wall, whether the um, bacteria is gram positive or gram negative. And at this point, you're probably like, okay, yeah, what is, what is gram positive and what is gram negative? Um, and, and basically what we're doing here is a stain on the, on the bacteria, on the sample that we get from the, the dish or from, a, you know, a sputum or, or whatever the kind of source is. But mostly we're getting it from a colony of um, bacteria on the plate that we have grown from the sample source. And what we're doing is this process where we, uh, we, fixate, we fixate it on the slide. We add a chemical called crystal violet. Um, then we treat it with iodine, then we, uh, you know, decolorize afterwards. And what we'll find here um, is that, um, what we'll find is that due to the fact that uh, gram-positive organisms have um, more, um, 
more lipotechoic acid in their cell wall. That's what we're kind of seeing here. Due to the fact that they have that, they stain purple. So they hold this crystal violet in their cell wall. Whereas, you know, the, the um, cell wall of gram negative, they have um, this periplasmic space that, you know, is perhaps a little bit bigger, but they don't have this big cell wall that kind of holds onto this crystal violet. So what we see is when we add the iodine um, and then we decolorize it, which basically washes it away, and then we add the, the counter stain, that saffronin, um, which is, you know, the last step, what we see is that um, the because the cell wall is, you know, smaller in gram-negative organisms, it washes away and we get left with this pink color. Um, so we're going to see examples of both of those, but, you know, kind of um, put that into your head, um, you know, that this um, gram positive is, is this purple stain color because of the crystal violet. And then, you know, the gram negatives, they kind of come out pink. Um, and that's because of the decolorization and uh, saffron and counter strain or counter uh, stain, not strain. Um, and then the other thing that we look at is, you know, perhaps the um, morphology. Um, and, and, you know, O2, we look at O2 requirements sometimes too, whether it's anaerobic, meaning um, it doesn't like oxygen very much, or, um, or, or it's aerobic, it does like oxygen. Um, the other thing that we look at is um, morphology. So that's what this, you know, cartoon down here is showing. Um, you know, we can, uh, you know, classify it into three kind of broad categories. Um, so cocci, meaning like little balls of, um, little balls of uh, bacteria. And we could see them, um, you know, not just by their shape, but how they're arranged. So if they're in twos, we call that a diplococ uh, diplococcus, which um, strep pneumonia, um, strep pneumonia is one of them. Um, a streptococcus um, where it's in chains, like this one down here. And um, we often see that with strep pyogenes, um, which is group A strep, which is the strep that causes, um, you know, the, the classic strep throat, okay? We can see it in tetrads. We can see it in, um, we can see coccine clusters, which is consistent with um, staph. Um, and then another formation that we can see is kind of these rods. Um, and they look like exactly what they sound like. So uh, if we see, you know, a chain of, of rods, we often see that with um, anthrax. Um, and then, you know, we can see flagellated ones like salmonella. Um, and, and, and depending on kind of the morphology, it lets us, gives us an idea of what's really, what species it might be. Other than that, we might um, see it in spirals. Um, we might see some spirals, uh, spirochetes um, today, perhaps, um, hint, hint. Um, but other than that, um, you know, the other things that we really look at um, is kind of this, these special tests, these biochemical tests that we can do um, to delineate between, um, you know, things that may be similar. Because we can't just rely on the gram stain and say, okay, this is a gram negative um, diplococcus. It's probably, you know, strep pneumonia. Because we know that um, other diplococci, um, like Neisseria, um, uh, often Neisseria meningitis is a di gram-negative diplococcus. If we said, okay, it's a gram-positive diplococcus, okay, maybe it is this um, strep pneumonia. But we can't just use the, um, the gram stain because there's multiple different things that can be based off the morphology alone. So we use these special tests, you know, different things like whether it utilizes um, Lact, uh, lactose uh, or has the lactase enzyme to break down um, lactose. But we can also see, you know, things like um, if it's endol positive, so its ability to break down tryptophan to endol, okay? So that's just kind of an introduction to, um, you know, bacteria at this point. Um, we do have one case of, um, you know, where we're going to talk about parasites um, within this talk, but the vast majority we're going to talk about bacteria because that is a, a big kind of category, um, you know, similar to where, uh, you know, probably in your microbiology courses, you're probably focusing on bacteria um, more so than anything else. 
Um, otherwise, so here's kind of a little uh, chart that I think, you know, can be helpful. The chart that I have at the end of the presentation certainly I think is more helpful. So this is that thing where we say, okay, we did the, the gram stain um, and we can delineate to gram positive and gram negative. So uh, gram positive here and then um, gram negative over here. And then we can kind of say, okay, is it a caucus? So is it, you know, these little um, circles, these little balls? Um, or is it, you know, a cocobacillus? Um, that should be purple because it's next to gram positive. So, um, but otherwise we can look at, okay, yes, it's gram negative. Is it a, a rod? Is it a caucus? Is it a cocobacilli? What is it? And then, you know, based on, this is, I, I don't love this, um, this particular chart because it kind of is misleading you in that, okay, it's gram positive and a cocobacillus, it must be listeria. Um, the classification of bacteria is not that simple as this chart would suggest, but this kind of tells us that we can use these different um, aspects or characteristics of a bacteria to get to what species we're dealing with to correspondingly pinpoint the treatment because we know that not all bacteria are sensitive to the same, same antibiotics. We also know that over time, the antibiotics of which were sensitive for certain bacteria are no longer the case. So being kind of judicious, being very meticulous about what we treat um, these infections with is going to be helpful for our future selves so that we don't create this, you know, um, antibiotic resistance. All right. So let me clear all this and let's, um, let's kind of keep going here. All right, so um, without further ado, here's our, our, our first case. And I would love um, if somebody out there would um, unmute themselves and read the case for us. D don't be shy. We have a, a fairly small group today. I'll do it. <laughs> Since Yay. I spent my whole entire day reading slides, I shall continue to do so. <laughs> um, right. a three a three-year-old male presents with a two-day history of sore throat. The mother is, pre uh, is present who says the patient has been fatigued and unable to swallow secretions. The family has refused vaccinations in the past due to cultural reasons. Um, on examination, the patient is visibly short of breath, um, assuming a tripod position. So test to orders. So what test do we order? Does anybody have any ideas for what test we wanna order? COVID. Strep. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. COVID and strep. Yeah. I, I think you could at any time nowadays, anytime anybody comes with anything, you're probably testing for COVID. So um, good. So any, what other tests do we want to, do we want to know? This guy is not able to, this little guy is not able to swallow his own secretions. Um, Another thing that, that kind of stands out to me about this, not because I've written this vignette, but um, because it's important for a lot of um, microbiology, is that the, the, um, the family has refused vaccinations. Okay, so what other tests do we want to include? Any ideas? So we have a strep, okay, and we got a COVID test. Could you do a like blood culture to see it look for like measles or something because they are unvaccinated? Yeah, sure. We can absolutely do blood cultures or um, anything of the sort. So um, let me click to the next um, picture here. So this is our guy here. He's in a, a tripod position, which if you haven't heard of that, they're kind of leaning forward um, and with their neck out like this. And you can see it looks like he has, you know, this, um, you know, submandibular, this um, adenopathy. His neck looks rather large in this picture. Um, and um, yeah, pretty swollen. That's right. Um, so we could check for pertussis. Sure, those uh, measles and pertussis. Um, those are pretty high. I just, I was listening to the news earlier and there's like 16 cases of measles um, in, like in the United States or like watching out for it. So um, we could check for thyroid. Yeah, sure. That could certainly be a greater way to go. Um, we could check for mom, certainly. Um, so let me um, show you uh, what else we kind of saw on this exam here. So um, good ideas for all this. So we ended up getting an, uh, an x-ray of the, the head and neck. 
Um, and so this is what it showed. Um, and we also kind of took a look. So this is what the, the patient should look like. And this is what our patient looks like. So, and then we see kind of on um, lateral, um, lateral x-ray that we see kind of this, what we call a radiographic thumbprint sign. Um, so this is bad. Um, what structure is this? Do you guys know? Oh, I'm drawing all over the place. What is the structure that we're looking at here? Right here. Yeah, it's your epiglottis. So whoever put that on the slide, you're crafty. Um, so, I mean, it, it is close in close proximity. So, I mean, the epiglottis, the, the whole premise of the epiglottis is to kind of close um, when you're swallowing, close over the airway so that you don't aspirate your secretions. What's the problem with the epiglottis being um, swollen and angry and mad like this? Um, it shuts off your airway. So, you know, and also shuts off your um your, your uh, esophagus. I don't know why that word was so hard for me. Um, your esophagus so that you are you know, not able to breathe. Uh, he, might be, he might have a strider um, and he's not able to swallow his secretions. Yes, whoever said to get a strep, yes, you're absolutely right. With one exception um, is that, you know, you don't want to go poking around here because if you upset the, the epiglottis and you try to, um, you know, look past it or, you know, do anything that's going to make this more angry, it could shut off his airway, you know, resulting in an, an emergent uh, tra tracheotomy. Um, so you have to be meticulous about this, that um, the, the airway is the first management here. Um, in epiglottitis, okay? So good job with this one. Um, you know, I think you guys are absolutely right. There's no one test to order for this, but if we look at this, if we see this, we get a, a head and neck um, and we have high suspicion for something like epiglottitis, um, you know, we would want to obviously intubate this patient um, emergently to protect their airway. This patient can't protect his own airway. Um, those of you that said strep, you're right on the right track. We're going to talk about strep as well because it's a very, very common organism that you guys are going to see. Um, but good job with this one. So um, the um, let me clear all this. All right. So the diagnosis then is what? Do you guys know the diagnosis itself. So. We have, you know, um, a swollen epiglottis, epiglottitis, yeah, good. Um, it wasn't a trick question. Um, so what we're talking about when we say epiglottitis is um, this bug called Haemophilus influenzae. Um, do not get it confused with um, the, uh, like, uh, streptococcus pneumoniae or anything that causes Influenza. Influenza is is not caused by Haemophilus influenza, uh, influenzae rather. Um, you know this uh, this bug causes you know a few other things. It, it kind of is the culprit for a few things, including one of which that we have talked about together, which is meningitis. Um, it also causes um, otitis media, so um, ear infections, inner ear infections, epiglottitis, as well as pneumonia. Um, and then we know that um, streptococcus pneumonia also causes pneumonia. But this is a gram-negative um, coccobacillus. Um, it looks like down here on the bottom right-hand corner, you can kind of see um, you know, some of these coccobacilli here. Um, you could see some of them. Um, what is this? What are these? This looks like a sputum sample to me. Neutrophils. Yeah, excellent. Whoever said that, you're absolutely right. Yeah, those are neutrophils. Um, and, and what we see there is, is this is probably a sputum sample in that there's you know inflammatory cells there. Um, so that's what what we'll see there. We'll see kind of bacteria in the presence of, um, you know, immunologic cells trying to fight this infection. 
Um, so um, what we see here is um, a, a Petri dish. And what we do is we get um, kind of a sample. Um, and in this patient, um, you know, we may not, we're not going to go poking around at the um, epiglottis to, to get this. We might see, you know, take a blood culture as someone um, very um, smartly suggested to see if they are septic, meaning they have this, you know, in, in their blood. Um, and then plate it on this, um, this plate that we call um, a chocolate auger. Um, and what we see here is that um, it, it requires um, these two factors, um, factors X and V, um, one of which is um, hemonin. Um, and we see that um, due to the lysis of red blood cells, which is what kind of causes this color here, um, it's not like made of chocolate, um, that um, the haemophilus influenzae, because it requires that hemonin, those um, you know, lysed red blood cells, it grows well on something like this. So we'll see that it doesn't grow on you know, a regular blood auger. Um, it'll grow on something like this that requires those two factors, X and V, okay? Um, and, and the other thing is that this is vaccine preventable. So um, we know that HIV, um, that's a vaccine that's given, um, I believe, um, at two, four and six months. Um, don't quote me on that. I, I, it's been, I'm, I'm very far removed from my pediatric rotation, um, but I think that's correct. If any of you out there volunteer in um, uh, pediatric clinics, um, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but we treat this with cephalosporins um, like ceftriaxone. Um, this patient would likely be admitted, um, uh, probably not likely, he definitely would be, um, probably um, admitted to the, to the unit. Um, this guy is going to be um, intubated, likely in the OR, um, intubated, so that if we needed, there could be a surgical intervention because he's pretty sick. Um, probably get IV antibiotics um, as a result. So, all right. So that's our first case. You know, fairly, you know, simple. Um, we're just going to, you know, hit that, hit the next three cases very similarly. So you guys get exposure to a lot of things. Does anybody have any questions about this first case um, as far as um, epiglottitis? Uh, do we give steroids too? Yeah, likely, probably um, for systemic inflammation. Um, I don't know that it has a mortality benefit. Um, you know, steroids uh, could help with the systemic inflammation, likely, um, you know, reduce the amount of airway swelling as well. Certainly couldn't hurt. Um, you know, the, the reality is he's probably going to get, you know, a, a few things other than, than subtriaxone as well. Good question. All right. And, and in addition to, you know, before we kind of go on to the next case, um, we'll talk about strep as well. So what we see with strep, and, and it should be in your differential as somebody kind of very, um, very intelligently said to get a strep test, which, you know, you're absolutely right. If you see somebody who can't swallow their own secretions, um, you know, has exudates in the back of their throat, um, is febrile, is young, and, um, you know, uh, has um, lymphadenopathy, um, does anybody know what that criteria is called that we follow? All of those things that I just told you, if they're, you know, greater uh, than 44 and, and less than 14, if they have a temperature, not Jones. It's called the Centaur criteria. Um, we kind of use that in our decision to, um, whether to get a rapid test or just treat up front with antibiotics um, and then, you know, get a culture later if they're, if they're negative, if you have a high suspicion for it. So what we see is a cough. If they have a cough, it's less likely bacterial. It's probably more viral. Um, if they have exudates in the back of their throat, so like white junk on their tonsils, um, if they had a uh, lymphadenopathy, if they have a temperature, um, and their age. Um, so the age is um, less than 14, we look out, so younger kiddos. And then um, it's kind of bimodal in that we also kind of look at it for greater than 44, I, I believe is the age. Um, standard for all ages. I'm not entirely sure what you're asking with that question, um, but the ages are less than 14 and then um, 
at a, at a younger age as well. And this kind of guides our decision to make um, or to use antibiotics. So what we see with this is if um, we were going to, um, if we were going to get a gram stain of this, we would um, see gram positive proxy in um, chains. So if I were to draw that out for you, um, you know, it would look like, um, this. So we would see kind of them in chains when we take that. And what we do is we kind of take one of these colonies with our, um, our little device here and we take it and we put it onto a slide and then we do that staining process that we talked about where we have the, um, you know, we use obviously the uh, crystal violet, we counter or we uh, counter stain counter stain and then use the um, or decolorize and then counter stain at the end. Um, because gram positive have the increased cell wall, then we're going to see that it's thicker and we're going to see that it's going to um, hold that crystal violet. Okay. Um, other than this, um, we see that for strep uh, pyogenes, which the other word for it is group A strep. You might hear that. Um, it, we see that it causes a lot of things. It causes uh, things that you may be familiar with, like pharyngitis um, and petigo. Um, so kind of, um, you know, a, a lot of uh, skin dermatologic manifestations, cellulitis, um, scarlet fever, um, and uh, toxic, toxic shock syndrome. So, you know, the uh, classic cases are, you know, someone who has a bloody nose that leaves a, a nasal rocket um, in for too long, or women of whom leave um, tampons in for too long. It kind of festers, um, you know, uh, bacteria and allows them to colonize and, and uh, release um, toxigenic substances into the blood and, and the patient can get septic. Other things um, that we want to kind of keep an eye out for is necrotizing fasciitis. Often necrotizing fasciitis is polymicrobial. So we don't say necrotizing fasciitis and say, oh, it must be, must be strep. Um, we say necrotizing fasciitis, polymicrobial. Okay. The other one is rheumatic fever. Um, the important thing about rheumatic fever is it's important to catch. Why? Do you guys know? for two organ systems, so it's important for. Yeah, it has cardiac effects and the kidneys, yeah. So the thing that we, we uh, the word that we use is molecular mimicry. So basically what it does is the immune system gets, you know, a little messed up and it, it sees kind of these, um, these antigens for this uh, bacteria um, and, it kind of uh, can obviously mess up the, the heart, yes, and the kidneys. It causes um, glomerulonephritis and it can cause cardiac, um, cardiac problems as well. Um, so the, the thing about it is um, we can, by treating strep, we can treat the, the rheumatic uh, or we can treat the, um, the, or prevent cardiac toxicity as a result, but the glomerulonephritis um, may not be treated as a result of treating it. That's the bad thing. But um, in that, you know, it certainly helps um, to, to treat it, to reduce um, the effects of, of, um, of, rheumatic fever in general. And then, you know, for, um, for the treatment for this, we're going to use, you know, penicillins like uh, penicillin itself or amoxicillin. And then in the bottom right-hand corner, what we see is um, that strep in chains. Okay. Uh, and then the plate up here, it's showing you this um, thing that is common with strep pyogenes and that it is um, that it's beta hemolytic, meaning that on the blood auger plate, it kind of clears out the blood around it. So you'll see kind of this hue um, behind it that it's clearing, it's clearing out around it. So we, we call three different things, alpha, um, beta, and then gamma hem hemolytic. Um, alpha means it's like partial clearing. That's what we see with um, strep pneumoniae. Um, that's the um, bacteria that causes, um, you know, pneumonia. It's one of the most common ones. It also causes ear infections. Um, and then beta, which is what strep pyogenes does. It's that complete clearing. 
And then um, gamma hem hemolytic is a cute way of saying um, it, it, it doesn't hemolyze it, um, which I don't know why we can't just say it doesn't hemolyze at all, but we call it gamma hemolytic. Um, all right, so let's keep going here. I just wanted to throw that in so we were able to you know, really delineate that. All right, so let's have another person. Um, please read our next case, if you will. I can. Excellent. A 33-year-old female presents with a newly discovered rash after hiking in Massachusetts. The patient states that she has been otherwise well, though her family has noted a right-sided facial droop over the past few days. Exam reveals a right-sided Bell's palsy with normal neuro exam as well as bullseye appearing rash. All right. So um, what test are we ordering here? What are you guys thinking? MRI? Sure, we certainly can. Why, why do you say MRI? Just because of the right-sided facial droop. Um, it's like, I mean, obviously this is infectious disease, but that would be a sign of possible stroke. So you would want to get that to rule that out. Good. We could certainly get a, a CT first. Um, it, we can do a CT. Um, what If we're ruling in or out stroke, I don't know if you guys remember, I think you guys had a stroke talk um, many, many moons ago. Um, what we'll want to do is um, do a CT first because we know that strokes can be ischemic or hemorrhagic. And the way we delineate that is by a non-contrast CT because we know that blood lights up. Um, so good idea. Absolutely. We can do that. Test for Lyme disease. Sure. Yeah, we can certainly um, get, um, you know, test for that. Do you know what the test is for Lyme disease? That's okay. Um, but you're, you're, you're on point there. Okay. So, um, Here's some images. Um, she's like, look, uh, this is where I went. Isn't it so pretty? And you're like, yeah, but look, you're, you, you have Bell's palsy and you have this rash. So I'm a little less concerned about how pretty your picture is and more concerned about this rash that you have. But arguably, that is, it is a very pretty picture that she's showing you here. Um, so here's the rash that she's talking about kind of is, you know, exactly what the vignette is describing kind of this, uh, you know, it, it looks like it's a, a walking ad for, for the store target. Um, and then here she is, she was like, I took a picture of myself also to show you how bad my, my bell, my bell's palsy has been. So we'll see kind of that. Um, there's this asymmetry, that's what Bell's palsy means, um, that there's this drooping of the face. So she's trying to smile and show her teeth, but this side is kind of drooping down over here, if you can't see that very well. Um, other things that you can ask the patient to do is close their eyes very tight um, and puff up their cheeks, because we know that um, it requires different cranial nerves, so we can see what's affected. Um, so the, the facial nerve controls for the, um, for your mouth area and, and that will delineate it from other cranial nerves like the trigeminal nerve, okay? Um, so let's see, what, what are we gonna do for this patient? Any ideas? We said we wanna get a Lyme test. We want to um, do a CT to rule out a stroke, which I absolutely agree. Anything else? Labs, what kind of labs? We can get a CMP, sure, CBC. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we can get a C CRP and ESR. They're, they're fairly nonspecific, but there's other things. I mean, we can use it as a marker of inflammation for sure. Okay. All right, so what do we think this patient has if we had to kind of uh, decide right now? Yeah, you guys are, are kind of pinpointing it correctly. Yeah, this, this looks like Lyme disease. Um, that, uh, that bullseye rash is 
pretty pathognomonic for it, meaning that um, when we see it, we think this one thing. So we know um, that the organism is Borrelia burgdorferi. Um, it's carried by the uh, by a tick, um, and and that's the tick right here. Um, and I figured it, it wouldn't be a complete presentation if I didn't show you the tick engorged with a blood meal. Um, that seemed to be like the only the only thing I could find online anyway. It was like, here's the tick and here's it engorged with somebody's blood. So I, I figured I, I need to include that for you guys as well. Um, it's sad when it's on a dog. Oh, and I panic when it's on a dog. When my dog had a tick, you best believe that dog was scrubbed down and my whole house was scrubbed down. It was a mess. Um, but um, people injecting the full one with hydrogen peroxide. I don't want to see that YouTube video um, that you're talking about, but if you guys are interested, um, Parab said that there's a, a YouTube video out there of somebody injecting the, the full one with hydrogen peroxide. I don't want to see it. <laughs> I don't want to see it. I have a mental image and that's enough for me. Um, but we know the morphology of this is a spirochete. So it's, you know, they're easy to spot. They are just, you know, kind of like that. And if you look at this, um, if we look at this image to the upper left-hand corner, um, we have to use dark filled microscopy. Uh, and that's how we identify these. The infection that it causes is Lyme disease. And um, the, th this specific tick um, is also kind of the, um, is the carrier or the vector of other um, of other infections, um, other tick-borne illnesses, if you will. Um, so if we see this tick, it, it makes us think of this, but remember it also carries other um, other tick-borne illnesses as well. So we treat this with uh, doxycycline, but if the, the if we're dealing with a child or a pregnant woman, if our patient was pregnant, we would give amoxicillin because that's safe in pregnancy. Um, doxycycline, um, a, a, a fluoroquinolone is bad for, um, for children because it causes um, a tendon rupture um, and also um, uh, um, it could also cause um, other problems, uh, tetracyclines, that is, I, I, I think I said fluoroquinolone. Um, tetracyclines can cause um, problems with teeth as well. Um, so we want to avoid that in pregnant uh, women because it's, te uh, it's a tetragenic. Um, and then um, we want to avoid it in children as well um, because they're still developing. Um, and we want to avoid that teeth. Um, teeth to, uh, decay as well. Um, I think you're right, uh, for third and fourth generation cephalosporins can also be used. Um, and then the other question was, besides doxycycline or amoxicillin, are there other good treatments to use against Lyme disease? Yeah, we can use the third and fourth, I'm pretty sure, um, the third and fourth generation cephalosporins, I believe. Um, don't quote me, I, I'm pretty sure that's correct. Um, Though um, I'm not entirely sure about that one, admittedly, uh, but usually, um, usually amoxicillin and doxycycline are kind of the go-tos. Um, if not um, doxycycline, then amoxicillin. Um, okay. Any questions so far for um, this one? This one is fairly um, straightforward so far. All right, so um, the next case here, um, if someone else would please read this, I would very much appreciate that. Anybody, anybody? Can you hear me? Yes, great. Okay. Perfect. I'll go for it. A 30-year-old female presents with a four-day history of dysuria. She notes this is associated with frequency, urgency, and hematuria. On exam, the patient has um, sub subproputic tenderness as well as CVA tenderness. The patient is febrile without complaints otherwise. UA shows the following. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, so um, we talked a little bit about CVA tenderness. Um, 
sorry, I was just looking it up while he was reading that. And it looks like uh, cefiroxamine, a uh, third generation cephalosporin can be used. So that was in fact correct. And um, ceftrioxone, which is a third generation cephalosporin. So we can use doxycycline, amoxicillin, ceftrioxone um, can be used as well. And um, ceftrioxone, I believe is also safe in pregnancy, but um, we usually stick with those two. But uh, CVA tenderness here, what we talk about here, um, we kind of pinpoint um, that um, by kind of thumping on the um, costovertebral angle. That's what that means, CVA. Um, and that's really right below the 12th rib. So what we do is, is something called a Lloyd's punch, and you're not like punching the patient, so please don't do that. Um, you're kind of placing your hands on their uh, costovertebral angle and then giving it a little tap. Um, and what we see there is that elicits pain in certain things like, um, like kidney stones, like pyelonephritis, things like that. Okay. Um, so that's the CVA tenderness. When we talk about suprapubic tenderness, that's really right above the pubic bone. And, and that tells us, you know, maybe there might be something going on with, you know, the urinary system here. Okay. So, all right, so let's talk about the patient's UA. So we get a UA and we dip it. Um, and, and some of you out there um, may have experience doing this. Um, but let's say um, the glucose is negative, um, the bilirubin's negative, they, the patient has no ketones. Um, we'll say that the urine specific gravity is 1.020. Um, we'll say that the blood is two plus. How about that? Um, we'll say the pH is um, 6.5, um, the protein is negative, and um, we'll say urine, nitrites, um, we'll say positive. And leukocytes, we'll say that it's uh, two plus, okay? So what does this tell us? What is this pattern? The things that we're looking at here are blood, we're looking at nitrites, and we're looking at leukocytes. Good, yeah. So you guys are both on the same the, the same track there, UTI or pyelonephritis, and and very smart for throwing pyelonephritis in there. Uh, Madeline, why do you think uh, pyelonephritis is certainly a, a possibility here, given the patient's um, you know presentation? Yeah, the CVA tenderness, exactly. I just, I just told you, you know, when we tap on there, we're up at the level of the kidneys and there may be some inflammation there. Um, so what we see is, um, here's kind of, you know, the bladder, this patient, women are more prone to it um, due to, you know, having shorter urethras. Um, but what we see here is, um, here's kind of the ureters, here's my horrible drawing, um, here's the kidneys. Actually, that kidney wasn't that bad. I'm kind of proud of that kidney. Um, here's the ureters and here's the bladder. And what we see is, um, I'll draw it in, in pink. Um, so here's, you know, some bacteria, um, you know, from the urethra, you know, from whatever reason, because, you know, you're holding your urine too long in the back, in the bladder becomes colonized or, you know, wiping the wrong way or post-coital, meaning after sex, any of these things can predispose women to having UTIs. And what we see is, yes, it can get colonized in the bacteria, or I'm sorry, in the bladder. And then these bacteria, they don't like to hang out in one place for too long. They're like nomads. And so they'll travel up, they'll ascend, and they'll get into the kidney. And what we call that an infection of the kidney is pyelonephritis. Um, and then um, does anybody know the next test we should get for this patient? We did a urine dip. Now what? Two things. We can, we can do a, an ultrasound of the kidney, certainly. Um, we can get a culture, and I recommend it, especially since the patient's positive for leukocyte esterase and for nitrates. I'm looking for one thing specifically. Yeah, we can test for which bacteria, which will be the culture. So what they'll do is they'll take the urine and, and you know, streak it on the plate. Um, but what I'm looking for here is the urinalysis. Um, that's the, what we're going to look at. Does anybody know what this is? Um, we're looking at the urine underneath the microscope, and we see this. What is this? Is this just a bunch of junk in the urine? Okay. 
So this is a, a white blood cell cast. And what we see is that, um, you know, when there's damage to the kidney, um, we might see that there are, um, we might see that there are um, white blood cells that kind of collect in the form of a cast. Um, and then kind of are sloughed off into the urine. The other things that we see in, in things like renal tubular, uh, we, we can see renal tubul tubular epithelial cells and acute tubular necrosis. And those are kind of sloughed off into the urine as well. So what we can see is, um, you know, as a result of the pathology that's going on is different, you know, things in the urine. We can also see uh, red blood cell casts. They look a little different. You can really see the red blood cells. Um, but, you know, the urinalysis is really a discussion for another day. Uh, but what we'll see is um, a white blood cell casts in here, okay? So what's our final diagnosis, guys? Yes, exactly. So they have pyelonephritis. Exactly right. Um, so here's kind of that um, cartoon that I was just showing you. Um, obviously, my cartoon was a lot better because my kidneys were, were cuter. But this cartoon has uh, a little bit of an advantage on me. They drew the um, the kidneys on or the adrenal glands on top of the kidney, so they might have beat me. Um, so here's the bladder. This is exactly what I drew. Um, here's the bladder. Um, we see that uh, it can get colonized with um, bacteria um, and it can ascend and then um, cause pyelonephritis. So this is exactly what I just drew. Um, and if you know we don't treat this, this can cause an acute kidney injury cause an increase in the creatinine, cause an increase in the BUN, cause a decrease in the GFR. So we want to catch this and treat this. So the thing that we see often um, is um, what we see is E. coli. That's the most common. But other bugs are Klebsiella pneumoniae, which you're probably like, wait, why is a, a bug that, cause, that, is, that can cause pneumonia? Why is it causing this? Um, you know, a lot of these organisms can cause multiple different infections. The other one is um, Staphylococcus saprophyticus. That's the one that we usually see in young sexually active women. Um, uh, the morphology of um, E. coli and Klebsiella is a gram-negative rod. And then if we see gram-positive cocci in clusters, um, we might think that that is um, Staph, sap saprophyticus. Okay. Um, the infection that it causes is cystitis. So that's you know, your classic, um, you know, urinary tract infection. Um, and then the other one um, is pyelonephritis, which we just talked about. So we can treat this um, with, you know, ciprofloxacin. We can treat it with ceftriaxone. Um, cipro is a fluoroquinolone. Um, ceftriaxone is a cephalosporin. Augmentin is, um, uh, augmentin is amoxicillin clavulanate. Um, and, really that's a um, extended spectrum um, uh, penicillin really. Um, and, and what we're going to do is based on kind of what is the most common, you know, E. coli, we can give them something um, to kind of start them out when you do the dip, but you're going to send the urine off to the lab so that we can culture it. Because what we do is we culture it to find the organism as somebody um, had uh, suggested. And we're also seeing what the organism is sensitive to. So we test a bunch of different antibiotics and see the MYC, um, the mean inhibitory concentration, um, and then we give the correct antibiotic because antibiotic stewardship is of the utmost importance. And you'll learn that in school as well. OK, it's very important. Um, what are the indications to admit the patient for IV antibiotics versus treating outpatient? Great question. So we want to take into consideration the patient's risk factors. Um, if they're septic, they probably need to come in. OK, if they're um, if this is a non-complicated um, Anti or uh, non-complicated UTI, um, and it's a young, healthy woman who has burning frequency, um, you know, urgency. Then we could treat that person outpatient if they're, you know, septic, lethargic. Um, they have a fever, um, and, and we have, uh, we meet SIRS cr criteria, plus we have a source, they might need to come in because at that point they're septic. 
okay? If they're um, pregnant, um, we want to always uh, treat pregnant women. We all often check pregnant women um, and we treat them. The only people that we treat um, asymptomatic bacteriuria, so bacteria in the urine, the only time we treat it um, if they're asymptomatic is if they're pregnant because that can really damage um, you know, the, the fetus, the growing fetus if they're septic. Um, other than that, we might make the decision if the patient is pregnant and, and you know, maybe not doing as well. If they get an acute kidney injury, um, they become septic and um, they have acute renal failure as a result. Um, they might require a, you know, um, dialysis or anything like that if they have a problem in that regard. I would say that's the main indications for, for um, IV antibiotics. That's a great question. I'm sure there's certainly more indications, but those are the ones that certainly come to my head. All right, so we're off to the, um, the fourth and final case here. Um, let's get one more reader for this last case. Anyone, anyone? A 21 year old male presents with a two day history of large volume diarrhea. He states that he recently was camping and drank water from a river of which he claimed was a freshwater source. He describes crampy abdominal pain, tenesmus and bloody uh, mucoid stools. The patient is currently a febrile. Excellent. Thank you for reading that. So um, what are we thinking here? What do we want to do? Let's start with tests. Um, how do we want to delineate what our differential is here? Parasites, stool culture, sure. Yeah, he's having tenismus, he's having abdominal pain and diarrhea. We can certainly get a stool culture. If we're considering doing stool culture, what else do we want to get? If we're already sending it to the lab, what, what else do we want to look at it for? C. diff, sure, yeah, that's actually a great point. We can test it for C. diff, certainly. And we, we might want to discern if he's had a, you know, uh, a recent history of antibiotic use, sure. What I was getting at was um, fecal uh, WBCs. We can also get blood and urine tests, certainly. Yeah, it never hurts to, to check and see if his white count is elevated or um, he has a, an electrolyte abnormality. Great question about tenismus. Um, tenismus is this feeling that um, you have to evacuate your, your bowels and almost like a spasming. Um, but when you, when you go, nothing really comes out. So it's kind of this um, spasm of the, the rectum. Um, that can be due to um, toxins, can be due to different kinds of parasites and bacteria. Okay, great question. Anybody else, any other tests that we want to do here? Okay, so let's see. All right, so we get a um, stool culture um, and we grow this. So um, gram positive or gram negative? Good, gram negative, absolutely, you're absolutely right. And what makes gram negative uh, organisms gram negative? Why do, they, why do they show up pink color? They lack peptidoglycan. That's exactly right, yeah. So they have a smaller, um, you know, lipotechoic, or uh, the, um, they lack that large uh, peptidoglycan layer, yes. Um, and they sort of counter, or the, um, when we do the decolorization and the counter strain, uh, or the counter stain, I keep saying counter strain, it's a, a osteopathic uh, technique. Um, but when we uh, decolorize, it takes the, the uh, crystal violet away, and then we counter stain and it shows up pink. So you're absolutely right. A uh, larger um, peptidoglycan layer. And if we kind of go back, that's what we're, um, that's what we see here. 
So we see um, that, you know, when we when we look at this, this um, large cell layer that we see, um, you know, both have the peptidoglycan, but we see we have a larger cell layer um, when we when we look at it here. Okay, so let me jump back to um, where we were at before. Oh, too far. Here's where we were. Okay, so we have a gram negative, um, and then we do kind of these special tests, um, and we see um, a few things. So we're going to talk about these special tests here. So we see a, a, a triple sugar um, uh, a test here. That's what the TSI is. Um, we see a sim and an indole. So they're both negative, um, and we are looking for um, hydrogen sulfide production, which is also negative. Um, we test for citrate utilization, that's negative, and urea is negative. So we have, uh, you know, very underwhelming tests here, but um, what is your guys' guess? Um, we were looking at, you know, maybe a, a gastroenteritis, but what do you guys think based on, on what you know? We're going to talk about, you know, these tests here, but um, what do you think about GI bugs um, that you know of. We're going to talk about a few here in a second. E. coli is a good guess. Listeria, sure. This one's a kind of a harder one. Oh, and here's, he also brought a picture for you too. And he was like, wow, look, I swear it was fresh water. It was a, a really pretty place and here it was. Doesn't it look like it's fresh? And you're like, well, I don't know. Um, Vibrio, that, that's a good guess. Uh, Giardia, certainly good, yeah. Giardia, we're certainly gonna talk about um, as well. Okay, so this is a gastroenteritis and, and I, didn't get, I didn't think you guys would guess um, Shigella and we're gonna talk about that because the one that you guys probably know of is uh, Salmonella. Okay, um, I'm sure you've heard of people getting salmonella food poisoning, um, you know, from chickens and turtles. That's usually, when I think of turtles, I think of salmonella. And when I think of um, tularemia, I think of rabbits or vice versa. When people say rabbits, I say, you're going to get tularemia. Or if they say turtles, I say, you're going to get salmonella. So those are my associations and I stand by them. Um, the organism is Shigella. Um, and, and there's different kind of species of Shigella, but the one we're kind of looking at is, is this one. Um, it's a gram-negative rod and it can cause gastroenteritis. And, and these two things, uh, Shigella and Salmonella are hard to kind of delineate. So we use special tests. And the big one that we kind of see is that, um, that Salmonella has this hydrogen um, sulfide production. And that's what we're seeing here. It kind of shows up black um, and, we, we also see that it's a, multi, a motile organism, which can give us a lot of um, indication as well. They're both indole negative and they're both non-lactose fermenters. Okay, so that doesn't tell us a lot. Um, the ones that delineate it are these ones. So hydrogen, hydrogen sulfide, it's motile, um, it, it produces lysine and it's sorbitol positive. Okay, so that's what we kind of see um, on the, the triple sugar um, tests. Um, we treat this with um, Cipro uh, first line, so ciprofloxacin, that fluoroquinolone that we were talking about before, um, that we can use in UTIs. Um, and then we can also use um, a macrolide like um, azithromycin or ceftriaxone. Um, so we would want to, you know, maybe keep an eye on this if the patient has um, problems with their heart and are, you know, have a history of an arrhythmia, probably wouldn't want to use something like a, a macrolide because macrolides can cause um, prolongation of the QT complex. So probably not that one. We probably want to steer away from that one. Um, and then we'll, we'll kind of look at their um, risk factors, but we can use um, Cipro. But know in your head that we have to do cultures for this because a lot of um, gastroenterites are um, viral. So we're not gonna throw antibiotics at um, you know, a, a bacterial infection, okay? All right, 
Um, now, some of you guys talked about this, which you are very, very smart. Um, this is one of my favorite um, parasites. Um, if there ever was a favorite, I don't know why I have one. That seems a, a little morbid, but um, I like them because they're they're kind of cute looking. If you if you look at them, they really look like this. This isn't like you know photoshopped or anything. It looks like they have little eyes and they have a little mouth and. Sometimes they look like they're smiling at you. Like, let's find one that looks like they're smiling. Well, none of these do. They kind of look frowning. Mm. But maybe, well, this one looks a little stern. But I don't know. They have two eyes and they have a mouth. They're easy to, to spot. Maybe that's why I like them when I worked in the lab. But um, this is our, our friend or, you know, maybe enemy, um, Giardia lamblia. And this is a motile trophozoite that we can see um, often in the stool. And this comes from, um, from um, water as well. So that's why I kind of threw in that fresh water thing. So what we see is um, that um, people can uh, ingest this and then the, the trophozoite goes um, ex- uh, existation and then kind of replicates and then we see kind of two forms we see cysts and, and trophozoites by far the trophozoites are a lot easier to spot but know that in the stool we can see the cyst form um, so we we might see something here um, and then you know the thing about it is um, you know we often see kind of when they ingest um, water we also we often see it on like camping trips or whatever um, and, and it kind of, um, yeah, it kind of it takes its course. You obviously it goes into the GI tract. They multiply. You have the cyst and trophozoite form, um, and it causes you know this gastroenteritis. Um, this one's kind of a smiley face for a, whatever it's worth. They're easy to spot. That's why I like them. Um, but um, the treatment for this is um, what we call flagell, flagell that's metronidazole. Um, it works on, on, on these bugs. We also use it for um, things like um, Gardnerella vaginalis, um, uh, different things. We use it for uh, C. diff diarrhea as well when we get exposed to um, multiple um, antibiotics. C. diff is kind of gross. I didn't want to include it in this one because um, I think you guys, I, I would make more enemies than friends if I if I uh, taught you guys about a lot of C. diff, but maybe maybe in another day because when you see kind of the, the colon with all the um, with all the exudates, it, it uh, will make you a little bit nauseous. And if you haven't eaten dinner yet, then I'll definitely make a lot of enemies out of you guys. Um, okay. So um, we're wrapping up here, um, and I'm sorry for taking a little bit extra of your time, but it wouldn't be my presentation if I didn't. Um, but here we go. Um, this, this chart is a lot better. So here's our, um, we kind of delineate, here's our, this is gram positive. That's what we're starting with, this gram positive. I have gram negatives on the next side. But we can say we have rods here, we have the cocci here, and we have branching filaments here. So, um, you know, we kind of, uh, you know, abundantly talked about cocci today. Um, most of these are anaerobic, and we delineate strep from staph by this test called the catalase. Basically, what we're doing is putting hydrogen peroxide on a colony and seeing if it if it bubbles up if it has that ability to that enzyme um, the catalase enzyme to reduce that that hydrogen peroxide so if it does we call that a staph species and then we can do additional tests to delineate what kind of staph it is um, if they have this coagulase this ability um, to uh, break down uh, clots, um, then we call that staph aureus. Um, and then if it's coagulase negative, um, we're kind of in, in two um, categories here. Um, and we do something called a novo biosin uh, sensitivity. Um, if it's positive, that's um, staph saprophyticus. If it's negative, that's um, staph um, epidermidis, okay? Then uh, strep, we know that that's catalase negative. Um, that no hemolysis, remember that cute way of saying no hemolysis is, is gamma hemolytic, complete hemolysis is beta, um, and partial is alpha. And then we remember that um, partial uh, usually is this um, strep pneumonia. Uh, beta, there's our old friend, um, group A strep. But remember um, also um, group B strep, group A and B, B being um, strep agalactiae, 
um, the one that causes um, issues with um, pregnant women and can cause um, lots of uh, lots of issues actually. Um, that's also um, beta hemolytic, and we use the bat citrasin sensitivity to delineate those two species. Um, the other ones are, are the enterococci and um, strep bovis. And when we see strep bovis, we say get a colonoscopy. Um, that's suspicious for colon cancer. Okay. And then here's some other ones, branching filaments. We didn't talk a lot about these ones, but we can delineate them by their oxygen requirement. So whether they're anaerobic or aerobic. Okay. All right, and then here's our gram negatives. Um, we can, uh, you know, like the gram positives, uh, kind of separate them into um, diplococci, uh, cocobacillus, like our old friend, um, strep, or I'm sorry, uh, homophilus influenzae. Um, we can, we have some rods, we have comma shaped, um, like H. pylori, they love to call it H. pylori comma shape. That's the one that causes, you know, ulcers um, and, uh, you know, reflux. We, when we often see a patient that's ref refractory to um, traditional GERD treatments and doesn't have risk factors or maybe does, um, we test for H. pylori because often that makes that um, reflux go away um, and people can be kind of colonized with H. pylori. All right. Um, so, uh, let's kind of jump, let's see down here. So here's our gram negative, um, bacillus. Um, are they lactose fermenting? Remember our salmonella and shigella, the answer was no, they were both oxidase negative and that puts us down here. So we kind of branch down here and we say, okay, is it hydrogen sulfide producing? And salmonella is yes. Um, and also motile, while uh, shigella, the answer is no. And remember, if it is lactose fermenting, we, can, we go up, kind of off to this side with our ones like E. coli and Klebsiella that cause things like UTI, okay? So this is kind of, you know, a chart that you can use. And, and it, I know it kind of seems like a lot of information and you're like, well, I would probably have to look at this chart for everything, but you'll learn these things as you kind of go and in the association, associations with them and, and how um, some uh, infections are caused by certain um, bacteria and then correspondingly how to treat them. That's important so we can have this, you know, antibiotic stewardship, if you will. All right, so uh, time flies. Let me um, give you this post um, poll here. Um, let me re relaunch the poll. All right, so if you will, um, please fill in that uh, poll here. Let me know what your thoughts are about uh, what you've learned here. Um, and as always, um, I will kind of stick around for a few minutes afterwards to um, answer any questions that you guys have. Um, I hope you guys have learned something here today. I certainly appreciate you guys coming and listening to um, a, a series of cases. Um, I should have made another poll, but did you guys like the multiple cases as opposed to the one grandiose um, uh, case, or, or do you prefer the one kind of extensive case? Let me know what you like. Let me share the results here. It looks like uh, most of you guys kind of uh, did move along. So some of you guys said you know a lot. Some of you said no, you know some, but nobody said nothing, which I'm humbled by. Um, and you guys like the multiple cases. Awesome. So I think I'll be back in, I think I'm signing up for like every other week. So I'll probably be back um, in I think two weeks, but um, I will be back. Let, let me know the topics also in the chat that you guys are interested in seeing. I know you guys said a lot of OBGYN stuff, which um, I immediately was like, let me find somebody for you guys to do that. But let me know if there's any topics that you guys are interested in. Um, I think I'm doing one that's coming up as um, a vascular thing. So I'm going to talk about a lot of aorta stuff, the big bad aorta. Um, but let me know if there's any topics you guys are interested in. I'd, I'd love to talk about things you guys are, are specifically interested in.